So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone for joining us this evening for uh, the Fox Islands Broadband Task Force's presentation of the 2020 Broadband Report, an internet planting, planning document for the town of Vinylhaven. My name is Gabe McPhail, and I work in the Vinylhaven Planning and Community Development Office, where I facilitate committee and town projects. And I'm joined behind the scenes tonight uh, with my colleague, uh, Matt Jablonski, who is our current Island Fellow working for the town of Vinylhaven. So before we get started tonight, uh, I wanted to just touch on a few Zoom tips and guidelines for those of us who are uh, in the Zoom room tonight. So first, if you could stay on mute unless you're speaking. And we ask that if you're doing anything distracting or you have distracting things going on in the background that you keep your video off. And another issue that we are um, definitely aware of is that there's a little irony of having a meeting about fast, reliable uh, broadband um, or fast, reliable internet um, where a lot of people who probably want to participate or who are even here tonight might not have fast, reliable connections. So if you do lose your connection, you can join us by phone. That number was sent with the meeting invite, but Matt is also going to put the phone number and the meeting ID in the chat. So you can call into the Zoom meeting if you need to. And just a reminder, if you're joining us by phone, that mute is star six, and that's to mute and unmute. Um, the other thing you can do is to rename yourself if uh, your name isn't listed as you would like um, people to refer to you as, or you'd like people to see. So uh, just feel free to um, um, click on the participants tab in, in the toolbar, hover over your name and the participants panel, select more, and then you can rename yourself. And if you want to add anything else like pronouns or your affiliation, you can do that. And then um, just recognizing that maybe there might be a couple of Zoom issues. If you do um, have anything going on that you think Matt could help you with, just shoot him a message in the, in the chat. He's also going to put his email in the chat, and uh, you can email him if you need to. So I also wanted to mention that we do have a lot of people joining us in the Zoom room tonight. Um, and we also wanted to be inclusive of folks on Facebook. So we're going to take advantage of the Zoom chat and the Facebook's Facebook comments um, feature. And we'd like to ask anyone that has questions as the presentation is happening um, and even um, during the Q&A uh, section of the, of the evening at the end um, to please put your questions in the chat or in the Zoom comments and Matt is going to collect those for us. And uh, when we have the Q&A, um, we will start with the written questions. And then if there's time, people in the, we can call on people in the Zoom room uh, for verbal questions. So I think what we'll do now is introduce our speakers. So um, I've already shared who I am. I'd like to introduce uh, Jan Ann Sherman. So Jan Ann is a retired history professor from Tennessee. Uh, Jan Ann settled on the island in 2013. And in 2015, she joined the Fox Island Broadband Task Force to help assess current and future broadband needs and options for our community. She serves as the task force chair. Mark Alette is the author of the 2020 broadband report. He's the president and CEO of Axiom with the responsibility for overseeing all aspects of day-to-day -day operations and growing Axiom's internet business. Axiom's mission is to bring world-class connectivity to unserved and underserved areas of Maine. 
This work has given Mark a strong track record of successfully writing and securing federal, state, and foundation grants that have helped communities move internet projects forward. Mark has led a number of island projects that have been built or are being built, including Cliff Island, Cranberry Isles, and Monhegan Island. These projects are serving customers with fiber optic internet that one resident described as better than they get in New York City. Kendra Jo Grindle is a senior community development officer at the Island Institute. She's the strategic lead for the organization's community infrastructure programs. This includes broadband and sea level rise. She's also the project lead for the broadband team. Also with us tonight is town manager, Andy Dore. And I believe we have at least a couple of members of the Fox Island Broadband Task Force with us tonight. Um, I think Norbert Laser is here and possibly also Bob Barrett. Hi, Bob, I see you. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the evening for either Andy or uh, Bob or Norbert, um, when you put your questions in the chat, just make sure uh, to direct them toward, toward those folks. So to get us started tonight, um, we wanna ask you all a couple of questions that we feel are really key to understanding how good our current internet is. So we're gonna ask you to participate in a quick survey. So Matt is gonna put a link in the Zoom chat and in the Facebook comments. So when you see that link, if you'd like to click on the link, you're gonna be taken to um, a site that has a, that's gonna walk you through a couple of prompts. So just go through those prompts and you'll get to two survey questions. So you should see the questions. Do you know what your internet speed is? And are you getting or exceeding the internet speeds you're paying for? So it might be that you're either watching this or joining us using your data. Um, so maybe you don't even have internet at your home uh, or maybe you're joining us from a different location where there's better internet. So if that's the case, can you let us know by checking don't have internet? So go ahead and answer the questions if you haven't. And Matt is going to uh, show us what this survey is looking like real time. So folks say, it looks like most people know what their internet speed is. And in a way I'm not surprised because I think we have a, a uh, internet aware crowd and likely most of us are, are here because we're interested in having better internet. So we probably know what our current speed is, but we do have some folks that don't have internet, which is, is good to know and we know that is definitely an issue on the island. So the next question, are you getting or exceeding the internet speeds you're paying for? So it looks like 50% of people who have participated in this poll are not. 31% are, which isn't bad, but 50% aren't. Significant. Great. Thanks, Matt. So we're going to revisit these questions when we loop back around to the end of the presentation. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of what we're going to go through tonight. Um, we're gonna look at just a little bit of background 
on the Fox Island Broadband Task Force. Um, Mark is going to give us a high level overview of the report. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps and recommendations that the committee is putting forth. And we're going to um, end up with uh, Kendra Joe um, showing us a neat little tool that has to do with internet speeds and mapping. So a little broadband speed test project. And then we'll um, end the evening hopefully with uh, 15 to 20 minutes for uh, questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Broadband Task Force, Jan Ann Sherman. Jan Ann. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm really glad that you've joined us this evening. Um, let me introduce the task force to you. We have nine members, many of us have been on the task force since the beginning. Bob Barrett, who's here tonight, George Foskey, um, Eric Gasparini, Norbert Lesser, Patrick McCormick, Donald Poole, Riley Poole, and Patrick Shane. We got started in 2015 after the publication of the Tilson study. This was an engineering study sponsored by the Island Institute to assess internet access and options for all the islands in Maine. It included an infrastructure report, a satisfaction survey, and an estimated cost of fiber to all the premises. So inspired by this study, um, the task force was formed to figure out what we have, what we need to do in order to have accessible future-proofed future internet. Oh, I'm, I have to beg your indulgence. Yan Yan, you, um, act, oh. <laughs> it looks like um, Ginger is uh, demanding Jan Yan's attention. Um, so I'm gonna step in for her um, and just give a quick, um, a quick uh, follow up here. So you'll see the broadband task forces mission on the screen to support the town and its efforts to pursue a broadband solution for Final Haven that provides affordable, accessible, accessible future proof internet speeds to everyone in our community. Sorry, that was UPS. <laughs> that was too interesting for Ginger to ignore. Um, are you, Jan Ann, are you fine with going to the next slide? Yes, please. Super. So our overarching goal basically is the sustainability of the way of life on Vinyl Haven. Broadband or high-speed internet is no longer a luxury, but a necessity. It is to the 21st century what electricity was to the 20th century. It's a utility. It's necessary to do the basic work in households and in businesses. And the pandemic in, has recently brought this into sharp relief as we shut down schools and businesses, forcing families to turn to the web to do their jobs, to do their homework, order their groceries, visit with distant relatives and so forth. So our goals as a task force are as follows. Education is foremost, improved student connectivity from home. I hear stories now about the difficulties of students who have to go into town, who have to stay with a grandmother to do their homework because they don't have internet at home. But it's not only to do homework, but to access opportunities uh, to pursue higher education, to pursue technical education. And that can lead to good paying telecommuting jobs while remaining right here in Vinyl Haven. So that's the next item, sustainable economic development. Options for working remotely and also services for existing businesses. 
Under telemedicine, we're looking at saving countless trips to the mainland and including the ability of doctors and specialists to monitor those people who choose to age in place so that they don't have to leave the island. They can have first class medicine available to them on their screens. One of the most important goals is that we will have equal access for all, the same level of services to all locations. Good internet should not be reserved for only those living in town. But for now, we have Spectrum in town, some lesser consolidated communication services in some areas, and a hodgepodge of satellites, telephone hotspots, and none at all elsewhere. We seek speed and we seek reliability, a system that's gonna be able to work no matter how much demands are placed on it, Right now, the service in town, even the best service, is shared among many and speeds drop off in the summer during evenings when there's increased demand. We also looked at a future-proof technology. We sought a system that wouldn't need to be replaced anytime soon and that would far outlast recouping what it would cost to build. Fiber doesn't age out like copper, like cable. It requires little maintenance. It provides plenty of speed for multiple devices in your home or business. Several kids doing homework, mom doing the banking online, somebody playing video games, streaming movies, and so forth, all at the same time. I should note that all of these devices and more yet to be invented are using ever increasing amounts of bandwidth. We need more and more and more to keep up with the technology. And finally, a symmetrical service. Current speeds for upload are far slower than for downloading. If you do the speed test later, you'll see that. This might not matter to you so much if you're just watching videos or TV, but if you have to submit something like photographs, homemade videos, spreadsheets, large documents, you will need that higher upload speed to be able to do that. Okay, I think I've done my two slides. Let's carry on. Super, thanks, Nan Ann. Uh, so the work that the committee has done uh, up until, or had done up until 2019 and the goals that the committee um, generated really led to the logical next step of the town and the task force putting out a request for proposals. So what we were seeking was a high level view um, to better understand what a broadband solution for Vinyl Haven could look like. So we received a planning grant from the Island Institute to help support the hiring of Mark Alette um, from Axiom. And Mark um, worked with us uh, over the last year to generate what he will present tonight, the 2020 Broadband Report. So I am going to turn it over to Mark. I'm mute. You can hear me. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so I've produced uh, a 50 plus page report, which I'm going to try to highlight in about 10 to 12 minutes. So we'll see how good I do. And I'm probably going to talk without a couple of periods as I go along, but we'll like a little bit of a freight train here, but we'll try to get through sort of the overarching sort of view of what the report brings um, and what's contained in it. So thank you for the time and appreciate having the opportunity this evening. Just start with just the very basic, uh, what is broadband? Many people ask me this question and it's a very important question, but it's, it's now been defined at the federal level um, as a minimum of 25 uh, download speed, three upload speed. So three megabit, 25 over three megabits per second is defined as broadband at the uh, FCC. In the state of Maine, they've also aligned their broadband uh, uh, 
the 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 definition of broadband is 25 over three. So when you think about you know uh, at the state level, if you are not receiving at least 25 over three, you're you're considered unserved or underserved, even if you have an internet connection. It's kind of important as we go through my 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 report talk here. We'll just keep that in mind. So one of the things that Janan highlighted was the those benefits of fiber optics and what a different kind of technology can bring. And it certainly is uh, true that fiber optics can bring extremely high levels of internet speed, but it also brings uh, best in class reliability. And many of you understand what that means when you're trying to really quickly do something on the internet at four in the afternoon or 7 p.m. and you get that wheel of death and you can't do what you need to do. And reliability is a big, big problem within uh, current technology systems that you have on your island. So it's it, it really becomes a future proof if you were to invest in fiber optics on your island, really becomes future proof, good for the next 30 plus years. Uh, maybe even longer. There's fiber right now that's well over 40 years old in the ground and, and across the sea. Uh, bed of the sea that that's been utilized for well over 40 years. So we would expect once you get that system up and running that you'd you'd be able to keep that infrastructure for a good long time. Um, one of the things that we highlight in the report is is whether or not you should consider working with your incumbent providers. An incumbent incumbent provider is just a provider that's currently on your island. In your case, there are two. Uh, major providers on the island, Consolidated Communications and Spectrum. Both, both use the copper-based technology, however, in a little bit of a different way. And when you, I know that the committee and, and others have been trying to interface with both Consolidated and Spectrum, and, and just as of late, uh, the community has gotten an opportunity to speak with both uh, Consolidated and Spectrum, and Consolidated has come back to the town with a high level cost of $3.3 million to provide a fiber to the home option for uh, them to consider. Spectrum, while indicating that they have interest uh, in working with the town to date has not provided a cost estimate. And I would imagine at some point you might be able to get one, but to date they haven't provided one. If you were, uh, so one option for the town to consider is whether or not you work with your incumbent providers and whether or not they could meet their your goals, uh, the, the ones that have been described and will be described in, in future slides. The You do have some other options and one is to work with either a third party provider, an ISP, an internet service provider who's not currently on the island and you would bring in to operate a system or, or, um, or a second option, which we've touched on and begun to explore with in the broadband committee was to partner with a Fox Island co-op, the electrical co-op, and see if there's an interest that with them to partner on some level of uh, partnership where they would also be a partner in providing internet to the community. So those options are available to you working with on a broad stroke, working with your incumbent provider or, or looking for another provider or an existing um, partner in, in uh, Fox Island Electric. When you consider those other options, you're really thinking about these ownership models that we are, we've been ta we talked about pretty extensively in the app uh, in the in the report. And there are four that we highlight here that all being utilized in Maine right now. The first is the town owned and town operated system. Um, sorry about that. Uh, that is a um, that's a um, that's being utilized on Islesboro right now, the island of Islesboro. There's a town owned and uh, town owned operated, but operated by an ISP model that uh, Axiom is one of the operators of that kind of system. And on, that's being utilized on Cranberry Isles. Um, and there's an uh, owned by the island investors operated by an ISP that's being uh that's being operated. Uh, well, that's being that the Cliff Island is the island that's utilizing that model, and Cliff Island, uh, w which is part of Portland, when Portland turned them down to assist them in getting broad, better broadband, they went out and raised the money themselves on the island and, and paid for it to to happen on that island. Um, all three of those models are operating now, um, and then there's a fourth. Um, and that's forming a public utility. And there's been some legislative 
fixes to help uh, communities build or to to instigate or to start a public utility. Um, that's the model being utilized in Baileyville and Callis. And in that case, uh, Baileyville and Callis came together, formed a board, and they're overseeing an open access network in those two communities. So those are the ownership models that we asked you to consider and look at and, and evaluate within the report. And then beyond that, um, and then so just a general big picture overview, you need to think about who you want to work with and what kind of model you need to have. And once you do that, uh, you need to think about what the cost is going to be. And um, this part, a big part of the, the report is really estimating the total cost of a of a of building out to the whole island. And one of the things Janan spoke about was this access, equal access to all. And we provided a high level sort of worst case scenario estimate of 3.9 million going down to if good things happened, if you were able to attract grants, if you were able to, to avoid some of the make ready costs and some other things, you could maybe get the, the cost of the project down to about $2 million. We broke that up into sort of three phases we called north east and west you see the cost for each of the the different uh sections of a project we believe that uh the north certainly and maybe parts of the east and west also might be uh um might have uh, such poor connectivity that they, you might be able to provide uh, apply for a grant uh, to to help pay for those, but we 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 took those uh, those general costs, those high level costs, and we 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 brought them through a, a series of financial modeling at different levels. These are just very high high levels, just sort of first look, back of the napkin kind of looks, and uh, those operating models, best in case worst worst uh, worst and best case scenarios. Um, we were able to achieve a positive cash flow at the $2 million uh, mark uh, in a, approximately five years, meaning the town would not have to provide any level of subsidy at all or wouldn't have to find there would be a gap till about year five. And then after that, the, the system would pay for itself and actually overpay uh, back into the back into the coffers of the of the town if you decided to move towards a a municipally owned network. So those that financial modeling is in the in that uh, application is pretty sophisticated. We also did some revenue and expense modeling for about five years and made a bunch of bunch of assumptions there and all of that is 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 there for you to view the grant option i mentioned um there are several right now it's the best time to be thinking about grant options because this is the time when grant options are available to you uh right now uh both federal and state monies are uh either in line or going to be in line over the next year or two um, and this is the time when your community might start thinking about what kind of model, what kind of cost, you know, getting to um, a, a, a more, um, I guess I'd say more exact cost for depending on what kind of modeling you want to do, model you want to have, who you want to work with, all of those different choices are going to dep be dependent on what kind of cost comes out of the system, uh, what kind of cost you'll have to you, and you need to do a little bit more evaluation on that. And then uh, those grant options will be available to you over the next year, and Axiom always stands ready to help um, for you to consider what those options are and what, what might be available. As I said, I believe that the, the northern part of your community is very uh, not particularly well served and certainly the outskirts of the uh, to the east and west of your island also have some difficulty with um, with the level of service there. So you might be able to attract uh, certainly a state grant if you were to move forward in that direction. So I think that's all I have at the moment. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end. And I know there's a bunch more things that need to get done. So thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, really appreciate the work that you've done and uh, the long uh, time you've spent working with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so 
you know, we, we Mark mentioned uh, grant funding. There, there are a bunch of next steps that the task force um, has identified and generated a work plan around. And so essentially we, we sort of launched this um, in November when we uh, presented the broadband report to the select board. And we imagine that we will be essentially working on what we're calling a broadband campaign um, through May. And our primary goal really is to do um, outreach and engagement that will eventually lead to um, some sort of consensus within the community around what we are looking for um, and what we're willing to fund as a broadband solution. So, um, oops, excuse me. Um, so we were fortunate and we received a grant from the Maine Community Foundation to conduct this uh, broadband campaign. And we have some primary goals. Um, we really want to go back to the community, back to all of you, and understand a little bit better what we really have for goals for broadband. Um, we identified at the outset, Jan Ann talked about uh, the committee specific goals and some of those were generated through the Tilson report. Some of those were generated through community survey and some of them um, came through the work of the committee. So through um, outreach and engagement, we wanna really hone in on what the community's broadband goals are. And as Mark mentioned, um, continuing to engage with the existing um, incumbent internet service providers on the island, we want to better understand like if they can offer um, a build out to the, to the whole island, what does that look like? Is it feasible? And um, does it meet the goals uh, that the community has identified? Mark also mentioned um, Fox Island's electric cooperative. We have spent a little time in conversation with them. Um, it's, it's something that uh, we'd like to continue talking with them about. Um, but as of now, um, we're, we're basically just open to, to continuing that conversation and, and continuing to gauge any interest they might have in a project. And um, through this work, like I said, we really want to come to some kind of community consensus. And we see that we essentially, um, I, we say here one of two proposed options and, and that's really there's two ways that we see of sort of meeting these goals. And one is to work with incumbents um, or work with the existing um, folks on the island or um, do something um, on, our, on our own as a community. So um, what, what I'd like to do now is um, just talk um, a little bit more about um, the grant funding process and the timeline that we're using um, I'm going to turn it over to Kendra Jo from the Island Institute. Um, Kendra has been really integral in helping us uh, design how we're moving forward and thinking very strategically about levels of community engagement and the importance of that community engagement in seeking grant funding. So Kendra Jo. Thanks, Gabe, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, yeah, like, I mean, like Gabe said, um, this step of community engagement, it's really critical. Um, you know, in the beginning, thinking about broadband, it's, it's, uh, it's really necessary to go out and, and talk to everyone and understand the landscape of your connectivity, understand what the, some of the issues are, survey, um, and just have an idea of, do people want to continue to look into this further? Now that this committee has, uh, task force has spent so much time and starting to really get solid estimates down for what this could look like, it is a, the right time to go back and start having more serious conversations because now you have something a little more tangible to work with, um, various options on the table. We haven't seen any, any two communities do this the same way yet, it seems like. So um, these, these both the operation model and the financial model it's really as unique as every community is because there is a there is no one size fits all, and it's because of community engagement and community voice in the process that lends to deciding what really works best for not just the community as a whole, but residents uh, on an affordability level um, for the nature of your and environment of your community. 
seasonality of your community. And that's where you'll start to decide what the right um, operation model is, who the right provider is, um, what their focus is on, what they can what they can bring to you. It really changes the dynamic of what we've always known as internet access. For Mainers, it used to be and had, is still currently a little bit of the provider gives you and 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 that's what you have. Um, but the way the community driven process is set up um, and the way that this is moving forward, it, it puts the, some of the power and conversation back into the hands of the residents in the town to say, this is what we need from our internet service provider. And this is what we need and uh, to sustainably move forward, not just the next five years, but the next 40 years even uh, and further with our broadband connectivity. Um, so this work that's been going on has been really incredible. It's a great co conversation to keep moving forward. Um, right now for grants at the state level, there's a lot of conversation that's happening around the infrastructure grant rounds and uh, kind of kicked off last month and will continue this month. Because the Connect Main Authority has the $15 million from the bond that was passed in July, 75% of Mainers um, approved that bond for broadband investment in um, underserved areas. Um, and so that's more money than we've seen the Connect Main Authority have ever. Um, it's really incredible. We really do feel like it's the first of, of hopefully not the last bond round that we'll see. Um, and a small portion of what we can continue to see in the future. The Connect Main Authority does have a, a session coming up on December 14th to start to look at guidelines and scoring uh, around the next infrastructure round because there is not only more money, but more interest from communities and providers in these funds. They're um, you know, expanding their thinking around what these infrastructure grant rounds will look like. So those are all open to the public. Um, if you need that information, I'm happy to you know, reach out. I'm happy to share it. I believe that the committee might also have it. If not, I'll send it your way. Um, but it's open to the public. You can hop online on December 14th at one uh, and listen in and engage, or you can submit written comment or survey or facilitate uh, participate in their survey as well throughout the week. We um, currently believe that their goal is to have their first infrastructure grant round sometime in the January, February timeline. So kind of aligning around um, winter to early uh, winter town meetings. The, um, because of the $15 million, we are hoping, and, and it seems the Connect Main Authority is moving in this direction as well, to have more than just one infrastructure round. So breaking up that $15 million over um, two, if not three uh, grant application rounds. This also aligns better with town meetings that occur in spring and in summer. In the past, there's been one infrastructure round and it didn't always match up with the, all of the actions that needed to occur on a town level to, to set forward contributions. Um, gearing up for those grants, community engagement is critical, uh, very, very valuable because not only are communities better positioned to receive state funding when there is community contribution, um, but also when there's community contribution and community engagement, we see a higher increase in take rates or subscriptions um, to the service that would be built out. And that just shows that this, to the state that there really is that community buy-in. This isn't just building a network to build it or broadband for the sake of broadband, um, but it is building the network to the extent that it meets the community's priorities and that there are you know, numerous, you know, um, are generally, we like to see take rates between 40 and, and 50, 60%. Um, so building a, a, a network that there is an overwhelming amount of the community that's um, wanting to subscribe to and, and utilize. We also um, see that as infrastructure gets built out like that, especially universal infrastructure um, and, and reliable infrastructure that those take rates tend to continue to increase um, because of user experience and the sharing of user experience. So I can't uh, say enough how important community engagement is to um, successful process, successful grant rounds, uh, as well as just the profitability and, and market uh, marketability of any infrastructure that's built, whether it's no matter the ownership model. Thanks so much, Kendra Jo. And just a couple of, of follow up is that I will um, uh, put the Connect Main Authority um, 
information uh, out through Facebook and on the web page and the town web page. Um, we did attend the last um, uh, meeting and it was it was really great. Uh, the process was used to get information from participants and really try to shape the grant funding process to best meet the needs of the applicants. And um, in relation to community engagement, just what um, you all can look uh, forward to, um, we will be um, launching more community conversations. Uh, like I said, we're, we're hoping to do this over the next uh, two to three to four months. And uh, we'll present a variety of different topics, different speakers. So keep an eye out for things um, on the website, through Facebook. And those of you who have signed up, I will also email you, uh, signed up to join us by Zoom tonight. I'll also email you to let you know what's, uh, what's going on and when. So I am now gonna turn it back over to Jan Ann. Okay, basically, I'm just gonna summarize what we've all heard here. We see two primary options to achieve our goals for broadband. It's a build your own system. That is, we own it, we control it, we choose how to run it or partner with an incumbent. From a business standpoint, it's not economically feasible for a provider to service everybody on this island, given that we're scattered around and thinly populated. So that means that a partnership, uh, the town must in some way um, subsidize the business in order to provide the needed infrastructure. So that's our two options, build it, own it, or partner. So now we begin the conversation to learn which goals are most important to you. What option you think is the best. So as um, Gabe said, our next steps are gonna be focused on learning and achieving community consensus around these plans. We wanna hear from you. We wanna to talk to you. We wanna present you with, with the best information that we can to help reach this decision. But we believe that the time um, for a solution is now. In the past five years that we've been working on this, and especially recently, digital inequality has become a state issue, it's become a national issue. And certainly it's brought home to us with the pandemic, which has changed all of our lives. And as several people have pointed out, there's funding opportunities on the horizon. It's time to seize the day and we're all eager to get on with it. So I hope you'll keep in touch and keep talking about this. Tell all your friends, tell them it's all online so they can watch it when they can get to an internet. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jan Ann. Um, I really appreciate uh, your work and your ongoing uh, dedication to universal broadband on Pine Island. So uh, as I mentioned at the outset, when we did our little survey, uh, I said we would loop back around to internet speeds. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Kendra Jo to tell us about this project. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the main broadband coalition, along with partners, the Island Institute, uh, Maine West, G uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments and the Connect Maine Authority uh, kicked off the Get Up to Speed speed test initiative. Um, and so what we have done is kicking off in November and going for at least a year, we are asking all Maine residents um, to give us your, you know, to be our citizen data collectors. Log on to the Maine Broadband Coalition website, which is right down there. Um, and take the statewide speed test. And so what you'll do is, uh, thank you, Matt, for putting that in the chat. Um, so what you'll do is you'll get there and you'll, you'll click on the speed test link. It'll ask you a couple of questions. Do you wanna give your full address, partial address? And if you don't have internet at all um, at your home, we ask that you still log into the internet, whether it's using your phone or going somewhere else and log and, and click on the speed test link 
but um, select the third option. And what that is, is it says that you don't have access at your home. And it'll take you to a screen, no matter what option you have, will take you to a screen that you can put in your uh, address. And then um, for those of you who do not have internet access, um, that's all you'll have to do, click submit, and it'll put a black dot on our, our statewide map. Um, if you do have access at your home, what it will do is take you to a screen test, uh, a speed test screen. Um, and it'll do its little download, upload, test your latency, and then give your results. From there, you can click on checking the live view and see that your dot has shown up on the map. And there are some dots already on Final Haven as well as North Haven. And um, you can view that map at any time. You don't have to take the speed test to, to view it. Um, if you go onto the main Broadband Coalition website under the speed test set that says run my speed test, you can also um, find more information or click view the map. And that'll take you to that statewide map. You can zoom in on any area and start to kind of identify what those speeds are. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen, if I can show that map, what that map looks like. Yeah, you definitely can, yep. Okay. Um, I'll just need the other sharing to stop, I believe. Okay. All right. Let me just... Everyone should be seeing a, a speed test map. So I'm going to zoom in on Maine. Um, and over here, you'll see a key it kind of tells you what all of those little, all the colors mean. And as you zoom in on, uh, on Vinyl Haven, you can start to see that there are some dots that are already there. Um, and what this test does is it'll tell us a bit about your user experience. So um, you can hover over the dot. So we have a dot here that is Charter Communications and, and they registered um, the first number that you'll see that 8.17 is the download speed and 3.1 is the upload speed. And you can tell the date and the time that they took it. Um, we do encourage people to take the test a couple of times um, to kind of start build, building what the real experience is at various times of the day. Um, we do ask if you're on a VPN that you go offline of your VPN and use your, your um, home-based connection and that um, you try to close down some of the other things that might be running on your, on your internet um, to get more of a true read. This data will be collected and looked at. Um, and what we hope to do with it is, you know, really start to see what Maine looks like broadband wise. Where are those gaps? Where are the really un and underserved. If anyone knows, has been following broadband, broadband mapping is um, quite inaccurate and, and really hard to come by. Um, and so this will start to give us what that user experience is. Communities have been doing surveys for um, as long as we've been working in community-driven broadband, but those uh, the speed test results on those surveys kind of stayed with the community. This way it goes to a statewide level. We're able to look across the entire state the Connect Main Authority, the Broadband Coalition are all able, policymakers, they're all able to look at this and really start to see what Maine looks like. Where are their last mile issues? Where are their complete towns that are really just left behind um, by service providers? You can even kind of see where maybe your, your own technology is letting you down. You have a router that's probably kind of ancient because you, all of your neighbors have green and you have red. Um, you might it might let us know that maybe it's a it's a technical issue in your own home and start to address that as well. We're hoping as we see communities come online with uh, fiber or their own infrastructure that we'll see some of these red dots turn green. So we're focused on communities like Monhegan, Roque Bluffs, Bremen, um, who will be hopefully building out next year and turning more to green. As you can see on Islesboro with their fiber build, we have a few green dots. We also have a blue dot that's registered over 500 um, megabits per second download. So this data is one piece of, of a lot of information that the Connect Main Authority looks at, um, especially as we look at infrastructure rounds, um, but it will be helpful. So 
I encourage you know, everyone on this call to, to take the speed test, ask others to take it. Um, and especially if the community is looking at seeking any state funding in the future, um, encouraging your, your community to show up uh, you know, very well on this map so that we can get a better understanding of, of what's going on. Stop sharing. Thank you. Great, right. thanks so much, Kendra Joe. And uh, we will also have that speed test on the town website and we'll push it through um, Facebook as well. And it will be part of our outreach and engagement over the next couple of months. So it's not the first time you will be seeing it. So I really wanna thank uh, all of um, my co-presenters here today. Um, we have our emails uh, posted here. So please uh, reach out at any time with questions, uh, anything you wanna talk about. As Janan said, we, we wanna hear from you um, and you will be hearing from us. So we um, are fortunate and one of my biggest goals uh, for tonight was that we wouldn't spend the whole time uh, presenting, but that we would get to uh, Q&A so we would have enough time to get your questions uh, answered and, and hopefully um, have some good conversation around broadband uh, and the future of broadband on Vinyl Haven. So um, if you haven't already uh, posted questions in the chat, uh, the Zoom chat. That would be uh, great if you wanted to go ahead and do it. And if you if you want to direct your question toward anyone in particular, um, please just say that like question for whomever, and um, we will note that when we when we ask the question. And for those joining on Facebook, um, please use the Facebook uh, comments feature and uh, share your questions that way. And Matt will be rounding up uh, questions uh, from Facebook for us. So I'm going to go ahead and get to our first question, which actually came in um, earlier today via email. Um, so this is an interesting question because Mark does uh, talk a little bit about 5G and is 5G an alternative? Um, and we talk about in the report that it's a ways down the road. And a question came in uh, today um, asking in particular um, if anyone uh, on the islands or, or anyone on Vinyl Haven had received an invitation from SpaceX Starlink network. And Kendra Joe, I believe you have some information about main islands and Starlink. Yeah. Um... Well, I can't speak to if anyone individually on Vinyl Haven has received an invitation, but I can speak to um, at least one main island that has had the has had a satellite pointed to their community. Um, Swans Island in the last week uh, had a satellite turn or last two weeks had a satellite pointed to their community. They were able to um, connect with the sales team for Starlink's um, beta program and um, be able to you know, follow their guidelines and get the right number of people. I believe the baseline was uh, 30 or 40 um, people ready and willing to enter the beta program. $500 for the, a one-time $500 fee for the technology and $100 per month. Um, this evening at their committee meeting was the first time we'd heard any feedback on um, the experience of that, the what we had heard so far is um, someone was registering at 44 down and four up, um, and that the service was better than what they currently have. Um, their provider is TDS, and they see typically see speeds 
around or less than 10-1 um, in some areas of their community. And they also, um, it's, it's a satellite, so you still have some of the similar satellite issues that you might have with, uh, a, with another provider such as HughesNet. So latency issues um, being the first one. It is a lower orbit satellite, so the latency issues are um, a little less than you might see on some other satellite um, providers. So that is the, they are kind of right at the latitude threshold. Um, I think it's uh, 45 degrees is what the program is, was looking for, 45 and above. Um, and they are just right under it. Um, but they, they did quite a little bit of engagement in their community to get the, kind of that baseline measure and, and get a satellite pointed at their community. They, for the most part, the committee still feels that it is a short-term solution to a long-term uh, to a problem that's um, you know, much greater and uh, that the SpaceX program uh, and Starlink is uh, still not affordable for, for all in the community. They're the only community I know of in Maine that has had a satellite um, directed at them so far. I could be wrong, but they are the ones that I know of. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a, had a couple questions uh, come in about um, this the speed test. Um, so someone was asking, um, will there be time to do speed tests in the summer when the service is significantly deteriorated? And then uh, another seasonal user um, question around, um, uh, will the speed test still be available? And um, I know you, you spoke to that a little bit, Kendra Joe. Do you just want to give us the time frame again of when sure. people can take the speed test? Yep, the license uh, is available for a year. So we're looking at a year from November. So November 2021 is when, um, at least for now, the Connect Main Authority and NBC could renew that license for longer, depending on the data collected. But um, so it will definitely be up. We recognize that there are quite a bit of residents and, and owners in Maine that do, do not live here right now to take that speed test. Um, so it will be up in the summer. The um, point about kind of the degrading service in the summer when there are more residents online is a good one. I think at least for the Island Institute, what we are planning to do is taking some screenshots um, periodically over time. One, to see where things change as things get built out, but also to see what it does look like as seasonality shifts in the, in the main communities and um, potentially service goes down. We will also encourage committees to um, zoom in on their community specifically and take screenshots from time to time, especially if you have something like a, a large uh, resident increase or um, or starting to build out some, such as a phased approach of a build out. Super, that's a good uh, reminder for us to remember to do that. Lots of screenshots. Right, thank you. Um, and I, this might be a question for Jan Ann. It actually might be a question for um, town manager Andy Dorr, if you're if you're willing, Andy. Um, but the question is, um, is there a sense of how people feel about this, and is this doable? So I don't know if um, if either of you are up for taking this question. Yeah, I can give it a shot. Uh, so yeah, first, thank you everyone for jumping on today. This is a great turnout, I think, for starting this, or continuing, but really kind of starting the second phase of this community discussion. Um, is it doable? I think other communities around us and in the other parts of the state have proven it is certainly doable. Um, as far as how the sense of the people feel about it, I think we still need to find, get a better sense of that. And so um, through the next phase of reaching out to the community, hopefully we get a better understanding of that. Um, the work that Mark put into this report, I think it's important to know that there's two, I think, I think critical parts of this next step um, or making this doable, which is how is it funded? Uh, to what degree might grants or uh, private donations or partnerships help offset um, the impact to the tax base? Um, Islesboro chose uh, one unique way of doing this. Um, other communities have others. So um, how it's funded um, and how that breaks down um, and affects the monthly um, homeowner. Um, the other big piece I see is the take rate. And so any of those models that Mark had created, we were mindful of 
um, looking at, you know, kind of best case, worst case scenarios on take rates, acknowledging that there are two very big incumbents out here um, offering two very different types of service in very different parts of the community. Um, so I think with those two factors, to me, I've been most interested to kind of see and learn more about that um, as we try and hear from all of you um, as we go forward. Jan Ann, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, I'm sorry, you, you just went on mute. Oh, okay, sorry. I wanted to explain what take rate is because um, I'm a non-techie and I had a lot of time, a lot of trouble just figuring out what some of these terms meant. And that was one that really flummoxed me. It basically is how many people are gonna sign up for this service? You're gonna to have to have a certain number of customers in order to make it viable. So the take rate is how many of the people who have nothing will, will take it on? How many of the people who have other services think that this one may be better? So that's the take rate. And it's a very key component to making this a viable process. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Um, Mark, I was hoping you might be able to also say something um, about, you know, is this doable with your experience on, you know, working with other islands? And I know that you, you did point that out in the report and, and stress that to us that you felt that we had a viable project. Yeah, I think that the, uh, I think increasingly, and especially in Janan spoke to this eloquently, I think, but we're, we're all aware that the current internet service providers in Maine are being stressed by the increased demand. And it's no longer a seasonal in the summer increase. It's now basically year round. People's demand on their systems are just so much greater, not just because of um, the coronavirus, the pandemic, uh, and all of the people working from home and kids working from home, but just generally, the use of the internet is just exponentially increasing every six months. I think it's doubling worldwide. I mean, it's just a huge, um, it's just really a, you a, really a, the kind it, it, people cannot live without the internet anymore. It's just so important to people's daily lives. So a lot of these communities, when they started to think about, you know, how do we stay vibrant? We're a rural community. How do we stay vibrant? And uh, over, you know, over the next 20, 30, 40 years, a lot of those those communities that have moved forward really fell to uh, the Internet and fiber optic connectivity as sort of the way for people to, to for their community to have access in a way that allows people to work, play, school telemedicine, all of the different things that a fiber connection can did, can bring. So in some very small communities, and, and many of you have been at, you know, your own town meetings, and I've been to several town meetings um, where people have had an extraordinary turnout, hundreds of people at a town meeting never seen before, um, fist fights. <laughs> I've seen it all at town meetings over internet um, where, you know, communities have voted for extraordinary levels never before seen uh, of funding to help get better internet connectivity. And, you know, that's not necessarily the process forward here, but it is a way to tell you how important some communities are really viewing their future and how connected that is to connectivity to for their for their community members. So to, to think about an extraordinary extraordinary effort on Cliff Island, part of Portland, who now Cliff Island has better connectivity than Portland does. You know, I mean, downtown Portland. I mean, it's just the people out there just decided we're going to do something for ourselves. And we're going to do this, and it's very important. And certainly, when you live on an island, I know all of the other things because I've worked on islands now long enough to know that the docks falling apart, how's ferry service going, 
Um, what is uh, sea level uh, rise and climate change doing for our island? How do we retain our young people? How do we uh, keep our schools open and vibrant? All of those things require an extraordinary effort by Andy and his team and the board to, who have to grapple with this on a daily basis, on a yearly basis. So I think I just say that it's really a matter of where your priorities lie as a community. And many communities are seeing internet as emerging as really, if not the number one um, issue, it's certainly in the top three for the kinds of things that community communities need to move move forward. So if you taught, you know, I know Kendra Joe and I can put you in touch with all of those communities that have, have invested in the internet. And I think they'll tell their story pretty eloquently about their satisfaction with that, making those decisions. Thanks, Mark. Um, we have another um, seed test question. Um, and someone has been collecting data um, since uh, the, the task force, uh, I think it was Jan in the 2018 survey that was uh, sent out. Um, and so the question is uh, the, the survey and, and, and I know Norbert was involved in, in this survey. So the speed test survey that was part of um, that survey um, is the one that is being offered now the same thing. And um, this person is saying they have uh, years of HughesNet data and consolidated data that they've been collecting for speed tests. So this is probably a two part question. One is I'm assuming it's not the same um, seed test survey. And then Kendra Joe, is there a way that uh, someone could uh, be getting that data to you, would it be useful, helpful? So Jan Ann? It's not the same. Actually, on our survey, we asked people to, we gave them a link and asked them to test and let us know if they were getting what they were paying for. And I'm sorry to say that a vast number of people did not bother to answer that question. Um, I had other people who said that they couldn't find out what they were paying for, even by calling spectrum and consolidated to find out what they should be getting. And then a few um, noted that they were paying for 100, but they were getting 25. So it was all over the map. And that's why I'm so happy to see this sort of central collection of this material, um, because it's really vitally important. Super. Thanks, Jan Ann. Kendra Joe? Uh, yeah. Um... I'm always happy to look at that speed test data. I think that it's a valuable piece of, of any committee's um, use as well. So if the committee would be willing to, to look at that and it just gives it a historical guidance for how service has potentially increased or degraded over time. Um, it's always useful in applications to have some um, historical knowledge it, before we had the um, statewide speed test, it was up to communities to singularly go out and seek this data on their own. So um, I know, at least for us, I'm always happy to look at that and, and pass it along to both NBC and Connect Main Authority, just to kind of keep an idea of what we've been seeing. Um, but I still encourage everyone to um, utilize the main broad, sorry, for my acronym, main broadband coalition speed test uh, link so that we can um, keep moving forward on a statewide baseline. Because like Janan said, it, um, not everyone filled out community surveys and it really did just stay with communities in the past. And we're really hoping that now um, there can be a statewide use for this data and a region or even regional use for the data. Super, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have what is probably going to be the last question for the evening, um, but before I, do that. I just wanted to see if there's anyone in the audience who, uh, the Zoom audience, who hasn't been able to use the chat feature to put in their question. They would need to verbalize their question. Okay. So um, I'm going to do my best to sort of combine uh, a couple of questions that I think are probably going to be directed to Mark and and possibly Andy, possibly Janan. Um, but Mark, this is a, this is a, uh, there's a couple questions that relate to infrastructure, and um, the, there's one question about uh, what exactly is our connection to the mainland currently, 
Um, how are we getting uh, service currently? Um, who, who is providing this service? Um, and also sort of a question, yeah, I guess who is providing it, who controls it um, essentially. Um, and then, um, so that's sort of one, one, one part of the infrastructure question. The other is uh, one of our favorite topics in the committee, poles, um, talking about the fiber being carried on poles and um, it, it essentially can the poles that we that are existing now, which are either Fox Islands poles or they're owned by Consolidated Communications, um, can they can they take another uh, uh, line on the pole? Will it hold up uh, in a storm? Is it strong enough? Um, so I'm going to add one more one more piece to this, which is um, someone had asked if um, there is any consideration sort of the feasibility of could could a north end broadband project somehow partner with north haven mm. um, so mm. i don't know if that's related but it's an infrastructure project so first part was what is our connection to the mema now um and the second question was around poles and um can they can they hold another line and um the third um would the north end would it be feasible for the north end of the island to uh, work with North Haven? Okay, so let me do this because uh, those are so simple questions and so complicated answers. But let me just try to make it as simple as I can and just say there are two ways that you get internet connectivity on islands, any island in Maine. One is by an undersea cable fiber, typically. Um, and the second is through a wireless to the tower system that brings a wireless signal, typically licensed and quite strong actually nowadays, um, to the island. In your case, in the case of Vinyl Haven, you do have an underseas cable um, that is that goes to North Haven, and that services that island fiber, and uh, then. It's been a little murky whether or not there's an underseas cable that has served your island from North Haven or from the mainland. And so I'll, 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 I'll just say that it's likely that you have an underseas cable that's serving your island also and that uh, we can provision service from that underseas cable typically in a wholesale environment uh, to be able to provide service on the island or can service the island with a wireless system um, and both systems uh, Axiom personally have used um, and on different islands than yours, but we have used those both of those systems and both are operating now in the case of Shabig, we have service on Shabig. We, we provision a wholesale provision, uh, wholesale connection using their underseas uh, fiber to serve uh, Shabig Island. In the case of Cranberry Isles, we use a wireless system that delivers a gig of service over a wire, uh, over, uh, uh, over radios that are connected to, my God, I'm gonna say it, a tower that they constructed on Isles, uh, on Islesboro. So uh, the, those are the two ways that you can get connected. And I believe your service is done by undersea cable uh, that's either provided by Spectrum or by Fox Island. It's a little tricky on how that works. And Andy and, and the committee can talk a little bit more about that. But I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Second question about fiber on poles. This is a this is a perennial question that gets asked of us uh, all over Maine. And the question really is, um, what about are the poles able to handle another line, um, putting another line on them, especially in the kind of environment that you find yourself uh, uh, in on islands, because that typically degrades poles over many years. And so it's sometimes challenging uh, to to have the proper engineering and provide put another line of fiber on the poles. Um, that is a process called <laughs> that's called make ready. And that process would have to be undertaken on your island to determine what number of poles would need to be replaced and what it would take to put a, a line of fiber on the poles. 
there's a second concern and you, I think it was spoken of in the chat a little bit about storms and about how that, you know, what's the likelihood of damage happening on the poles. And I just want to just be clear, most of the fiber is put on poles, not just in Maine, but around the world. Uh, that's typically how the utility that how fiber is delivered. Uh, but we have a variety of methods that Axiom have used, again, just our personal experience where we've put up our own poles again on on Cranberry Isles. We decided to forego the poll licensing and poll make ready process and put up our own poles across the island. Um, and we are also on Cliff Island and some of the other islands that we're talking about, we're going to be a Monhegan, for example, we're putting fiber or have put fiber directly onto the ground or buried it. So those are all options available to your town. The, le the least expensive option given your island and it's just my gut feeling in my experience, I haven't taken this very far is to try to put it on the poles. I think that'll be the best way to deliver. There are a lot of uh, issues to consider if you put it on the ground or in the ground, that's not to consider that it's not safer to do that or is safe to do that from a storm and such, because I believe it is, it's just as likely that you will stay up and running on the ground or in the ground as you do on the poles. But there are some ver a lot of questions that you need to answer now. OK, last question about can can the north part of the island get served uh, from uh, from North Haven? Uh, sure. Uh, there are lots of ways to serve the, the the island. And as I mentioned, if you're willing to uh, put up a. a, a um, I was gonna say tower again, I'm trying to think of another word, uh, but if you were put to some, some infrastructure on your island, you can serve anybody anywhere, even with the existing infrastructure that's on your island now with the incumbents, we uh, a third party internet service provider or they can put service anywhere on the island as you need be. So yes, you could do a discrete project that would serve only the northern part of the island, whether that comes from North Haven or some other location, you'd be fine to be able to do that. Mark, thank you. and. Um... I, I, we definitely are at time. We're just, a, we're a little bit over. So um, I want to um, wrap up and say, if there's questions we didn't get to, we're definitely going to uh, look through the, the questions that have been uh, shared and we will uh, do our best to answer those uh, through the website and we'll let you know um, where you can find that information. Um, I'm going to put up um, just real quick our contact information again. Um, if you um, would like to reach any of us with questions and um, just please, like I said, keep your eyes and ears open for um, more things coming from the task force around uh, broadband on Vinyl Haven. And I want to thank our presenters again and just thank everyone for joining us this evening as we embark on this uh, hopefully a uh, final um, community uh, process for universal broadband on Vinyl Haven. So thank you everybody. And we hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is great. Appreciate your help. Good job, Gabe. Mm -hmm.